Welcome, everybody, to Breaking Bread. This is Wednesday, the 14th. It is Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. So Ron got the message. Lee got the message. Linda got the message. I got the message. Donna got the message. We're all wearing Cupid Red. How about that? So um, happy Valentine's Day to all you guys. And we are going to be going through John chapter 10 today. Before we do... Let me just give you some updates on some prayer requests, uh, especially for the folks who watch us on YouTube later. Um, Marty mentioned that he did run into John Welch. Uh, John seems to be doing much better. Uh, looks like the reason for his falling was just a simple B12 deficiency, which as Lee said, is easily fixed. Um, Marty also uh, continues to please remember his brother-in-law, Paul, who's in the nursing facility. Um, you know, we don't know what God's plans are for Paul. Pray that Paul would come to know Jesus if he doesn't know him already. And that if it's God's will to take him home, that Paul would have a smooth um, journey there. And it would not be uh, painful or arduous for Paul if that's his will. If he wants to revive him, and get him out of the nursing home and, and restore him, then, then, you know, pray as God directs you. I always try to tell you guys, pray, unless you know something specific and you have a direct pipeline to God, pray the best yeah. and leave the rest to God. Um, let's also remember Lee's wife, Dot, who continues to walk through that heart recovery situation and pray that they would uh, get that delicate balance on medications correct so that she wouldn't bleed, but at the same time, she wouldn't clot. So uh, also for Bill, along those exact same lines, Bill still has problems with a clogged artery that's giving him trouble, and it's uh, dangerous uh, for Bill, but uh, it's also dangerous for them to operate based on where it's located. So Bill told me he's taking some steps with some um, medications and, and some foods that he's eating and just trying to trying to free up some of that clotting uh, and clogging uh, naturally. So just remember Bill and Dot in your prayers. And then uh, on a happy note, uh, uh, Jim's birthday, Jim is probably uh, 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 Paul and Jim. Gosh, I think they are Steve. They are our longest term members on here that are here today. You throw Dana in the mix too, but Dana's not here with us today. Um, and so Jim is having his 80th birthday and just uh, wish him well. He knew, we knew he wasn't gonna be here today, but happy birthday, Jim, when you see this on YouTube later. And then last thing was my neighbor, Tim. As you know, I, I, he is battling cancer. He went through radiation. Uh, there was a kickback on the radiation for the past three or four days, and he's really struggling uh, with side effects from the radiation. Uh, if you could just remember my buddy, Tim, as he goes through that process, ultimately pray that the cancer is um, eradicated from his body. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the cures are pretty tough on these things, radiation and chemo mm -hmm. and stuff. So just pray for him as he goes through this process, my, my buddy and neighbor, Tim. All right, with that, uh, I'm gonna ask Ned still unmuted. So Ned, would you kick us off in prayer this afternoon for today's session? Yes, I'd be happy to. Let us go to the throne of grace if we may. <clears throat> Almighty Father who is in heaven. Father, it's another day's journey and we're so thankful Father, we come before you to say thanks. We repent, Father, asking that you forgive us for our transgressions. Help us to forgive our transgressors. And Father, act, we ask for forgiveness for anyone that we transgressed against. We come asking for healing of our hearts, healing of our spirits, healing of our bodies, and healing of the land. Father, do what no other power can do, Father. Only you can do. Father, do that that only you can do. 
we gather today to fellowship with our fellow man. Father, we thanks for the word you will deliver to us through our leader, Lynn. May our fellowship be pleasing in your sight. May it be a benefit to each of us and let each of us hear, see, and understand what you want us to understand today. May it all aid in our spiritual growth. Father, show us our weakness that we may grow strong. Father, bless everyone and their family that's on this Zoom call today. And Father, we know you heard the many prayer requests, and I will call a few. Marty, brother-in-law, Paul, Bill's his heart, and his wife, Dot. Tim, Lynn's friend, John Welch with his father, Jim and his 80th birthday, and Dot's Lee's wife. Bless them all, Father. Bless our families, Father. Bless our friends and our enemies alike. Father, so many of us are struggling with challenges, but Father, we know that you have the whole world in your hand. Father, we pray for all who are dealing with viruses, many other illness. Father, but more than anything, especially the challenges of the flesh. As we go further in this fellowship, continue to guide us. Bless the teacher as your words come to us through him. Father, and we all say amen, amen, and amen. All right, guys. Thank you, Ned. Turn with me to John chapter 10. And as you're going there, I'm going to kind of give you um, a couple of overview items before we launch into chapter 10. Kind of important. I do this because you you might be lost because it's talking about some topics that as Americans, we're not going to be very familiar with at all. Uh, contextually, first of all, uh, this is Jesus's final public address. Um, he will speak, you know, obviously more teaching his disciples and having one-on-one -on -one interactions with people as John will record. We're nowhere near through the gospel of John. We're about halfway through the gospel of John, but this is the final time he gives a large public address. Um, if you remember chapter nine, it ended with, you know, Jesus had healed the blind man who was blind since birth. Uh, the, God, the poor man and his parents were cross-examined and grilled by the Jewish leadership because they did not want to admit that this level of miracle had taken place because it validated Jesus and ruined their power position. So what did they do? As we close chapter nine, they excommunicated the healed man and drove him out of the church. We talked a little bit about what that meant, it meant a lot more than it would to us, uh, because that was not only your religious central activity, but it was the center of all social activity and even business dealing. So this man would not be employable. He wouldn't be able to trade or barter with anybody because he was um, excommunicated from the synagogue. So we see that as we close chapter nine, but here we see something else. As we begin chapter 10, Jesus is going to address this very issue, and he's going to be talking about a new order, a new way. He's going to be talking about a new flock, uh, a new fold, sheepfold. So he's going to use a lot of terminology having to do with sheep, shepherds, flocks, and so forth, but it's all related to... Um, this new thing that this man, this, this once blind man can now be a part of and is in fact a part of. Um, now, we're not familiar with sheep and shepherds. We're not used to the terminology and how things work. So I'll explain some of this as we go along, but this is the metaphor Jesus is gonna continue to go back through all the way through chapter 10. Um, the role sheep and shepherd plays in, in Jewish history is tremendous. His audience would clearly relate to his metaphors and his analogies. Um, so we'll see Jesus, this chapter, portrayed in multiple different ways. But he's going to be considered the good shepherd. Um, and when you look at that and why he's calling himself the good shepherd, because there's a ton of Old Testament passages when they would get a bad king that was running Israel, um, 
they would compare him to a bad shepherd, right? So you get the you get the illustration. Here's someone who's supposed to be running the country, who's supposed to be caring for the people of the country, and they're doing a terrible job of it. And so this imagery of shepherds, good and bad, was used extensively in the Old Testament, especially about kings who have failed in their duty. So uh, for those of you guys, I like to jot this down to see Jeremiah 23 talking about bad shepherds. Ze um, Zechariah 11 talking about bad shepherds, Isaiah 56 talking about bad shepherds, and Ezekiel 34 talking about bad shepherds. And so we're going to get this contrast between bad shepherd and the good shepherd all throughout today's teaching. Now, the remedy for this is in Ezekiel 34 Verse 23, God promises he's going to raise up for, for Israel uh, a, another shepherd, but this time a good shepherd, someone who will lead his people properly. And so this has been prophesied all the way back in Ezekiel 34. And so Jesus comes on the scene. And in this speech today, he, he depicts himself in that messianic role of the ideal shepherd that Ezekiel 34 mentioned. Um, he's both the shepherd that lays down his life uh, for the sheep. And he is, he is going to refer to himself as the door to eternal life. So we'll see both of all of these um, uh, descriptions of Jesus used, the way he describes himself. Now, the last thing I want you to keep in context, because it's important. Remember, we have chapters. This was all just written in one flow. And it was last week we talked about this poor man that was born blind, that was healed. Um, I, do, I want you to remember the context of what were the circumstances. So here's this poor man. He's received this phenomenal miracle. And all the religious leaders have done is be unhelpful and even cruel to this man. And then he, they brought his parents in and they were threatening to his parents and mean to them. And then they said several things that were disparaging towards the common people that were listening because they looked down their nose at the common people. So part of what we see in chapter 10 is Jesus felt it was necessary to show a contrast between his heart and his work for the people as God's shepherd um, versus the work and the heart of the religious leaders and how have they ruled the country to date. So you're going to get these contrasts back and forth, and you're going to have Jesus referring to himself as the shepherd, the door. Um, you're going to see all these different ways that he refers to himself in, in chapter 10. So with that, let's go to verse 1 and 2, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Most assuredly, Jesus began. Remember, there's still a big crowd of people. The blind man has just been excommunicated. This is not a new scene. It's the same scene as we were in last week. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but by climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So, Again, we're going to talk about sheep and shepherds and, and pens and sheep folds and all that kind of stuff. And I'll explain that as we go along. But Jesus says anybody that doesn't enter the sheep fold by the door but gets in through some other way, that person is a thief and a robber. Now, who is he talking about? Um, so the thief and the robber are the religious leaders who are ruling the country uh, illegitimately. And Jesus is the one that came through the door legitimately. So we'll, we'll flesh that out in a minute. But let's explain something about sheep. So, and I'll do this multiple times because there's multiple references to sheep, sheep pens, folds, flocks. A fold is a smaller division. A flock is the larger division. I'm not military, so I can't, but some of you military guys will understand what that means from a standpoint. You've got smaller groups and then you got the big group. And so folds are the smaller group, flocks are the big group. And what would happen is the shepherds would bring their flocks in right before nighttime if they were by a nearby village. And they would, they would bring their sheep in. And in a, the village, there would be a 
sheep pen. There would be a, um, uh, a walled structure, usually five to six feet tall, high stone structure, where they would uh, herd their sheep and move them into this pen area. There was typically only one opening, a doorway or an opening, and they would put all the sheep in there for protection at night. Um, so the fold that Jesus is referring to is Israel. He's saying, he who doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. So Israel is the sheep, and these, uh, these illegitimate rulers were thieves and robbers, but the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So there's a proper way, Jesus is saying, to do this. There's a proper way to know if this is the true shepherd of the sheep or not. And if you climb in over the walls or get in some other way, you're clearly not the good shepherd. You're not the true shepherd. Um, I'm the one that enters in by the right way. You'll see this in just a minute. So there's a proper way to gain entry. These religious rulers did it improperly. Jesus is going to claim that he is the one that did it the right way. Now, Again, some of this is lost to us, what this is really means, but it's really making a staggering claim. Jesus said, I came in by the door. I came in legally. I came in in fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. I came in under the law. Galatians 4.4 4 says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. He came in in the line of David, according to prophecy. You can read that in Luke 1, verse 32. He was born in Bethlehem, according to prophecy. That's Micah 5, 2. Not only was he in the line of David, but he was born of a virgin, according to prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14. At the time he was born, he was the rod out of the stem of Jesse, which is spoken about in Isaiah 11, 1. So the religious leaders gain their place among the people through um, personal connections, political connections, formal education, ambition, manipulation, and corruption. They gained access to the sheep in the pen, which is Israel, the wrong way, like a thief. But only Jesus is the true shepherd that comes in the legitimate and designed way as foretold by scripture. Let's move on. He, he now talks about a doorkeeper and then he talks about the sheep. So verse three, to him, referring to himself, to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. So Jesus used this illustration, John said, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. They didn't get the metaphors. They didn't get the analogy. So first of all, he says, to him, the doorkeeper opens. In the pen, so you picture all these guys, they're bringing their sheep in uh, from the fields. They're all congregating in one central protected location. There's one doorway, and one of the fellows would be assigned the role of being the doorkeeper. And his role was to know who had proper business being in there, who didn't who was really a shepherd and who was in there to maybe steal a sheep, right? So there was a doorkeeper. Uh, so in the spiritual sense that Jesus is talking about, there's one who watches who comes in and who went out. Um, the doorkeeper grants the true shepherd access. Now there's a lot of disagreement and I, I always level with you guys. There was no consensus on who, all scholars have different opinions who the doorkeeper is. Some of them believe the doorkeepers are the prophets of the Old Testament who predicted the coming of the Messiah, of the Good Shepherd. 
Some people believe that the uh, doorkeeper in this case is John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of the true shepherd. And still others believe, and this is the one I tend to lean against, but really it doesn't matter to our topic today, but um, some people believe that it's the Holy Spirit who's the doorkeeper because only the Holy Spirit opens the door for Jesus to come into the hearts and lives of people. I think this one makes the most sense with the story Jesus is using. But anyway, he gains admission into the pen. He comes in through the right way. The doorkeeper lets him in. And then what happens? What says the sheep hear his voice? And he calls his own sheep by name. Now, I don't know if it ever, you wondered this, but have you guys ever seen sheep? Like a big bunch of sheep? All right, now I'm sure there are differences, but I don't know that you could call out and pick out your sheep, um, especially if you had like a hundred of them. You're not gonna have names probably for every single one of them. Well, you might, but you know, most of you can't even remember all your grandkids' names if you pressed on it in a moment's notice. You gotta think about it. So to, to remember a hundred different sheep, no, the, the idea was they would herd them into these communal pens, these sheep folds, and they wouldn't, they didn't care if they intermixed. They didn't care if they, you know, got mixed up all with another. And hey, that's Bob's flock and that's Bill's flock and that's Joshua's flock. It didn't matter because how would they get separated when they go out in the morning to go take them to pasture? Each shepherd had his own voice and his own way of speaking to his sheep. And listen to me, the sheep knew their shepherd's voice. So when Bill would come in and call his sheep out, only Bill's sheep would go to him. Bob's sheep wouldn't go to him. He's a stranger. The scripture tells you that. Uh, John's sheep, sheep wouldn't go to him because he's a stranger. They don't recognize his voice, but Bill's sheep would come to him because they knew his voice. Now, there's a ton of messages in here for us. Um, we are God's sheep. We are Jesus's sheep, and he is our shepherd. He says his sheep know him, know his voice. They know him. To know Jesus Christ is all important. And listen, guys, everything else becomes secondary. You argue theological minutia and, and, and find points and get in disagreements with people about this or that. Those aren't really essential things. What is essential? Let's just stop arguing about religion and about the details. The important issue is, do we know Jesus Christ? Do you hear his voice? Do you know the shepherd who calls you by your name? Don't ever make the main thing a minor thing and take a minor thing and make it the main thing. This is the main thing. The next thing I want to point out to you is, listen what happens. He calls the sheep. And what do the sheep do? He, they follow him. He leads them out, the scripture says. He leads them out. Next lesson. Shepherds, they don't drive the sheep. They're not like cattle. They never beat the sheep. They don't push the sheep. They lead the sheep. Now, this is something that is very foreign to us in our culture. Not just the sheep aspect but the fact that americans are driven we work we work well we work more hours than most of the countries in the world we we drive them we drive ourselves to exhaustion and we drive others to exhaustion we're go 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 even in our leisure that was never the way it was with jesus the good shepherd jesus does not drive you guys he leads you in other words, listen to me, he first goes through the valley of the shadow of death before he ever asks you to go through it. Do you need me to repeat that? He goes through it 
before he asks you to go through it. He leads you. Scripture declares that Jesus, our shepherd, our leader, our Lord, was tempted in all points. How many is all? All. Just like we are. And yet he did not sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that. So what does that mean? That means you're not going through anything. Absolutely nothing. That Jesus has not experienced himself, hasn't gone through himself, hasn't felt, or isn't feeling with you presently. You're not alone. You're never alone. Jesus never sends you into battle. He doesn't drive you into any kind of a trial. He leads you. He goes before you. You could teach an entire sermon on that. But if you learn nothing else from chapter 10, I want you to hang on to that. He is your good shepherd. He loves you. He leads you. He goes before you. And he walks with you through anything that you could possibly go through. He's either been through it or he's going to walk through it with you. You're never alone. Now, he continues, they will by no means follow a stranger. Now, again, this every every verse has a lesson attached to it. And I can't teach for 15 minutes on every lesson. But some of these are going to, the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you and go, that's for me. They won't follow a stranger. Sometimes it's frustrating. You witness to people time and time and time again, and especially if they're your family or friends, and you don't want them to go to hell. You want them to go to heaven. You want them to live this abundant life here on this earth. And they refuse. And you fret and you try harder and you try different things. And, and I, we all are subject to this. For a long time, that's all I did is I worry about people who wouldn't listen to his message. They wouldn't follow Jesus. But I, I don't do that so much anymore. Um, I don't worry about them so much anymore. Um, maybe the reason they're not hearing his voice is because they're not his sheep. Now, I'm, I'm going to get into the, the election versus free will stuff. I'm just saying that some people turn off like the religious leaders did, and they don't want to hear the truth even when it's standing right in front of them, even when they see this miracle of the blind man and they cross-examine everybody and it all comes back to this. Yes, this blind man was blind since birth and this Jesus healed him and they still won't believe and they still won't open their eyes. Just remember, guys, our role is to tell people. It's on God what they do with it. It's never about you. It's always on God and it's never on you. I, how many times have you told, oh, I could have done, I've done this. I beat myself all the time, beat myself up. I could have said that differently. I could have phrased that differently. I could have, you know, we had dinner with uh, some friends a few months back and I mistakenly assumed he was a nominal Christian. And it turns out as we got into deep into a dinner discussion, I don't, he's not a believer at all. And so he kept asking me questions and his wife would ask me questions and, and back and forth. And on the way home, I'm driving home with sugar. And I could have done, I could have said this. I could have done that. I could have said something better guys. It's not on us. It's on God. You can't save anyone. Only Jesus can, you know, do your best study up, do your best, but ultimately it's on God. It's not on you. So relax. It says Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't want to hear it. They wouldn't, they didn't understand it. Um, it distinctly says that, that they didn't understand. And the reason they didn't is because they were not true sheep. If they had, they would have recognized Jesus's voice and followed him, but they didn't. They dug their heels in and said, we're not going to believe him no matter what the evidence is. All right. Let's go to verse 7 through 10. I think I can do that before the break. Ron, that means I'll be halfway through. Um, so you pick up the second half, you should be good. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, he's still talking about sheep stuff here. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. 
and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they, have, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So I'm going to first direct you to one word and one word only on that. Look in your Bible where it says, Jesus said to them again. I want you to mentally underline the word again. Remember, they wouldn't hear him. Just last verse, right? They didn't understand his illustration. They didn't under, understand his metaphor. Then Jesus said to them again. Did he say, you stupid sheep? How can you miss this? This is so obvious. I'm writing you off. You're just too stupid to get this. Did he do that? Nope. He came to them again. It's your next lesson. How many times have you found that the Lord keeps coming to you time and time and time again, saying the same thing to you until you finally get it, until it finally sinks in? That ever happened to you? I think it's happened to all of us. Have you ever resisted something the Lord was telling you to do or to fix in your life? And then the next thing you know, a coincidental teaching on the radio or something you flip past on the TV or a billboard that you drove past or a friend says something to you out of left field that reiterates that same message again and again and again. Listen, the Lord is so faithful to keep coming to us time and time again, dealing with us, trying to fix us, concerned over those issues in our lives that need to be addressed because he is our good shepherd who loves his sheep. Okay, again, very good word there. He says, I am the door. You're going to see him make a bunch of I am statements. And yes, half the people who heard this are going to be immediately offended, want to pick up stones and kill him. Because he's using those same words that God identified as when Moses said, hey, who shall I say sent me? And, and like, what's your name? And God replies, my name is I am. All right. The word for that, right? Yahweh, the word, what we say, Yahweh. So this is the same word that Jesus is using when he, he'll say, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the, that's the same word. So remember, half of his audience are, are going to want to kill him when he says that. Half of them understand he's claiming to be God. So he says, I am the door. And this is another picture from sheep. Um, if you were out in a pasture, so you weren't in a village, you couldn't drive them into a walled structure to protect them for the night. You would construct a pen out of brush. And, you know, they wouldn't go past. You would just put a pen, you'd make it a brush, and there would be an opening, only one opening. And at night, you, he, the, the shepherd would lay across the opening and sleep. He is actually becoming the door. Uh, he's laying across there to keep the sheep in the uh, inside the enclosure, but he's also laying there to keep the wolves at bay, to keep the dangers outside, the thieves, the robbers, the wolves. Jesus says, I am the door. Now notice also, he says, and again, controversial, but super clear, explicitly clear. I am the door, the door. He doesn't say, I'm not one of, a, of one of the doors. I'm not a door. He said, I am the door. Everyone else is a thief. Now, Jesus is the only one who makes this claim. And you either have to be a madman uh, or demon possessed to be making this claim. He's the only way to heaven. And, and there's no wiggle room on this. He said, I am the door. I'm the only way to heaven. Um, so that's probably a good spot for me to go to break. So if you guys, I understand, uh, Ron, Linda, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, we'll drop off. We'll finish this and we'll uh, continue on with the rest of the scripture. All right, Donna, we'll see you back here. Ned, everybody else, uh, try to hop back on in the next few minutes.